Hello and welcome to the inaugural On Landscape Any Questions podcast. I'm here with Alex Nail and Joe Cornish. Hello. Um, and Alex Nail is the Hi. guest this issue for the rough topic of mountain photography, but um, he's got, he's also having just published a book, uh, a second book. I, I'm sure he can answer some questions around that or generally discuss what the process of creating books is like. Uh, as we both know, um, we've had a list of questions off people uh, and I've arranged them into a, an, an approximate order that makes sense for a discussion. But we're going to we're going to try and have uh, more of a roundtable discussion for the session. So uh, Brian Pollock sent in the first question, which I'm going to address it, uh, Alex, because it's to do with his book. And the question is, having just completed The Great Wilderness, how has your photography changed, evolved and progressed since the Northwest book? Now, if you want to give us a bit of background on the books for anybody that doesn't know them, that would be great, Alex. Sure, yeah. Um, I guess uh, evolved is is probably the right word. I haven't uh, made some any massive changes, but Northwest was um, my first book and had some pretty expansive mountain vistas in generally fantastical lighting conditions. And it really focused on that, that wow factor that you can get from the mountains and these, uh, these big scenic views. Um, and it covered the whole of the Torridonian sandstone area of the Northwest Highlands. Um, so that's Ascent and Koyak, uh, Fisherfield or the Great Wilderness, uh, and Torridon and the, the hills to the south, the Kowloon Forest. Whereas this latest book was actually the same area but just one of the chapters in that previous book so the, the great wilderness and uh, I, I think my style has changed in in various ways evolved is the right word evolved slowly because i think some of the things that i was doing in northwest do work well both for me and and the viewer um the reality is that that mountain photography um grand scenic mountain photography is a pretty tough game um so there aren't that many people doing it um, and certainly doing it with the regularity that I do um, and so I think there's an inherent value just in that that I that I recognize that uh, with with so few people doing it that it's it's important that it's carried on in in some sense and um, there's also the I mean people talk about whether they're they care who, who the viewer is. And I have always cared. I've always wanted to produce images that people enjoy. Um, and, and so I think what I was doing in Northwest was, was effective in that sense. And it's something that I wanted to continue. But that said, um, I think I did the, the wow game, the color game a little bit too much. Um, and so I've gone for more subdued and possibly honest scenes more regularly in the latest book, which is convenient as well because um it means that you can make a bit more of less Go spectacular on. conditions um but but also it, it you know in the intervening period we've had our eyeballs absolutely hammered by all of this fantastical um mountain photography from around the world um and and these incredibly exaggerated editing styles and I, so i think people are less impressed by that style of imagery and actually looking towards quieter images more often and that's certainly been my experience so yeah you, you do see some of those scenes a bit more regularly in, in the book overcast mountain scenes um and a, a few uh a few spectacular lighting scenarios but but certainly less than previously i'd, I'd be interested in in your take on this joe in terms of how do you think lands uh, mountain landscape photography has developed because i suppose our references are probably people like galen rowell and um Colin Pryor, and then obviously you've got your own Scotland's Mountains books. Have you seen any progression in the way it's represented, or is it really there is a, a, a self-contained way that you, you know, restricted way you can work, and so it's just variations? Well, I think I think the uh, styles of photography have definitely evolved uh, as much as anything with technology and the huge proliferation of access that there is to. Uh, to uh, I mean, I think to uh, work so people see much more of each other's work than than ever I did when I did Scotland's Mountains, for example. Uh, I, I was fascinated listening to Alex there to sort of think about how it worked for him and the the, the consciousness of an audience. I, I feel is one of the big differentiators uh, with my own approach. I would say um, I do think now that there's a 
an inevitable and it's something uh, I'm, I'm not criticizing it at all but i do think there's a strong uh sort of natural uh drift towards uh photographing with with an audience in mind partly for for many people who do youtube and so on um that's that's inevitable because you're working with an audience whereas uh you know, my own approach was based on basically going out and seeing what i could find at the time um and in the conditions that were available and i was i was always really impressed when i first started seeing alex's work that that he had spent so long in the mountains that he actually had been there when there were amazing moments of light. Because what, what I found doing Scotland's mountains is that the weather never played ball. So I was constantly having to just make, in a way, make the most of the conditions that I was given, which I came to the conclusion was really good for me. And it, it actually helped change my photography. Uh, and hopefully for the better, but I mean, it, it was, it was just a realization that I could make pictures in really quiet light and that I could love those pictures every bit as much as the more spectacular lighting that I originally had hoped to achieve. So I, I think that ultimately it is down to being, you know, a witness to what you see. And certainly just very briefly before I finish, just to say that Alex's book, to me, they're, they're both great books, but the great wilderness shows a maturity and a variation uh, that I'm not saying is completely missing, but you you know is definitely a step up uh, from Northwest, and 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 it's it's subtle in its variation, and and you see a you know just a wider range of seeing, and I I would say that as a viewer, that's really refreshing. It gives you a a, a much deeper sense of what it's like to be in the mountains in all different conditions. Certainly. Um... I think especially with, with, with introduction of AI and the pictures that you see from um, well, some of the photography proponents who create imagery that was very similar to AI that AI is probably feeding on, um, that that overblown, sublime uh, photography and, and AI art is it gets tiring. It's like being thrown sugary confections repeatedly. Um, and I think probably one of the escapes from that is to start seeing a, a large range of different environments, different conditions, because it's obviously a lot more interesting when you find a great photograph that's taken in not so great light. It's, it's more challenging and it's more satisfying in many ways, not only to create it, but to see it. Um, and in terms of an audience, I'm, I'm going to skip to one of Bruce Davis's questions here, because he's he, you mentioned about creating for an audience. And I'm wondering, he's, he's asking about how do you identify the readership? before you create a book? How do you identify who you're going to market it for? And I'm interested in how you did that or whether you did that. Is it, is it, is it important, hey, Alex? Well, I mean, I think it's very important when you're producing a book that you, that you find a readership for it. I mean, it's, a, it's a, a difficult subject for many photographers, really, because, of course, we want to pursue photography in, a, in an individual way. And I think, um, you know, Joe's approach, not considering the, the audience, is the way that many photographers would love to work, um, just producing the, the work that, that they would be most interested in themselves and then hoping that there is a market for it. Um, I think when it comes to photo books, though, that would probably be a big mistake now, unless you are so big a name that you can completely ignore what I'm saying, because uh, unfortunately, um, or, or fortunately, you know, th there are lots of titles out there now. Um, and there are lots of brilliant photographers and finding a, a way to differentiate yourself such that you can sell enough books to make it even feasible to, to publish a book or self-publish a book. Um, I think, yeah, it's, uh, it's difficult if you don't have a market in mind. And that's certainly one way in which having a, a, a view of what your readership or viewership might be um is is helpful and of course with with mountain scenics and beautiful mountain areas uh, like the great wilderness is um there are naturally going to be hill walkers and outdoor enthusiasts who are going to be a market for that book and so in many ways i i don't need to worry but that's certainly one of the benefits of of pursuing some of these more spectacular styles. I mean, I think this is uh, sort of aping off Joe's views, but um, I think he's mentioned in more a more eloquent way that beauty is a sort of way um, in which people can access the, the landscape more easily. It's a way to engage people. And uh, I think that's something that I, that I lean into. 
In terms of you, Joe, is it, uh, did, I presume, well, presumably where Scotland's main terms was produced by Eddie and Arch Ensem, they, they would have dealt with all that and you, they would have just asked you for a book on a brief. That's true. And, and yeah, it's very, it, it has changed unbelievably really since uh, I suppose it was the mid 2000s when I was commissioned uh, to, to do Scotland's Mountains. I had a publisher, uh, had an editor, uh, designer, and, uh, and really all I had to do was to produce the photographs and the text. And, and it was very much left up to me how I wanted to structure it. Um, I, I mean, it's a, a very different time. And the reader, the readership, the, 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 the audience was, I mean, I, I knew there would be photographers who'd be interested and I had a reasonable idea. There would be some hill walkers and mountaineers who might like the book as well. Just in that sense, it's no different to Alex's audience, but I didn't really have to worry about the marketing or, uh, you know, kind of the problem of having 2000 books stuck in a warehouse or, uh, or in your sitting room which is a much bigger problem <laughs> to have um especially if you live with somebody else uh, as i've discovered with uh, with a book i've done more recently uh so there is that issue and i would i would definitely be very careful now uh, if i was to set out to do a book of that kind uh thinking about how could how could i sell it so yeah i'm, I'm very conscious of that there was a it was a real privilege in a way to be able to work with a publisher and not to have that kind of pressure in the same way Having said that, of course, you know, we, I think we all want to work to communicate and it's not as if I'm not interested in having, um, having success with a book. But uh, I think in terms of my approach to photography, it's, it's always been just based on what's actually there and, and trying to find beauty in that circumstance, whatever it might be. It just amazes me that I was so... I have so few pictures in a way in Scotland's mountains that, that kind of fit the the mould of um, of being spectacular because actually that's one of the notable things about that piece of work. I think if you look at great, the great wilderness of Alex's, there's uh, every every chapter has some a wonderful range of different expressions in it, uh, including spectacular images. And of course, that's partly down to the amount of time Alex has spent at high altitude. Um, camping more commitment than me. I mean, I did I do a fair amount of camping, but it, you know, at the in the end, the most important thing is to be there a lot. And the longer you have, the better your photography is likely to be. I think. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to come back to one. Yeah, of I mean, it's, it's actually been. Sorry, go on, Alex. A bit of a delay here. Yeah, it's it, it's been. Um... It's been interesting for me, actually, in, in some ways, developing as a photographer with Joe's work to reference and kind of seeing that comparison and, and also knowing that the challenges that Joe's had just with his equipment when he produced Scotland's Mountains. I mean, you know, he talks about uh, how few images and I, I immediately when he said few, I thought, yeah, but you're shooting <laughs> five by four. And, uh, you know, lots of these moments happen in you know, such brief moments um, that that you would struggle, I think, to, to set up a view camera. So there's a degree of opportunistic, um, uh, well, just general opportunism and, and flexibility when shooting with smaller camera systems and so on that obviously I was able to take advantage of. But I, I think, you know, Joe's influence and, and uh, other photographers too, of course, um, in shooting in some of these more subdued conditions has certainly encouraged me to do that more when I started looking at Northwest and then comparing it to some of my other favorite mountain books. Um, and, and that's a big part of, of why I have slightly shifted in that direction. And in fact, um, one thing I, I thought for the next project is actually I need to do this even more. Um, because some of my favorite images actually are the uh, the overcast ones and in particular a trip uh, a photo that I took on a trip um, a workshop which I was co-leading with Joe out there and we didn't have particularly uh, interesting photographic conditions for most of the trip but on our on our last day we had an overcast evening a little bit of light striking what I thought was a really interesting rock and that's one of my favorite images from the book. In fact, I've got it big on, on the wall just here. Um, so it's it's still changing my preferences. Well, I can follow that one up with a uh, question from Brian Pollock, which is, um, what are the key ingredients of the ultimate mountain landscape image? Um, and this is going to be an interesting one for some interpretation of ultimate. Uh, either of you. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I mean, maybe you should start with this, Joe. 
Oh, it's very tem- it's very tempting to start because I mean, really, where do you start? In many ways, you could say, I mean, if, if you said, "What's the ultimate lands- uh, mountain image?" I can immediately think of two, and they are completely different. I would guess that most people we- will be familiar with the first one, which is uh, is clearing winter storm Yosemite by Ansel Adams, which is a mountain photograph, but was made from a car park. Um, you know, so just to put it into perspective. It wasn't difficult to do. It was just a a matter of bearing witness to an amazing moment of light and then being a a wonderful photographer and a wonderful printer. And then the other picture that springs to mind is a view from the summit of K2 by Alan Hinks, which is, uh, Alan is not, well, he's a photographer, but probably film, also filmmaker and a professional mountaineer first, not, not a pro photographer who makes his living out of it. Um, and and so he he's a he's a brilliant photographer. But the, what's amazing about the picture is it's literally on the summit of the world's second highest mountain. It shows the the shadow of that mountain cast across the landscape as the sun is setting. Two hundred and fifty miles of of landscape laid out beneath beneath him. And not only is it incredibly beautiful, but it, it holds this kind of fascinating. If he doesn't get down from there in the next three hours, you know, he is going to die. And so there's this kind of, um, it's the most extreme, sublime moment in a way in photography that I can imagine. It's a sublime picture, but it's also the the implications of, of what it contains. It couldn't be more different to Ansel's picture. So I think you have that, those two extremes and everything in between has the possibility of being a, a wonderful evocative image whether it's an intimate or a a very very broad vista i mean the two examples i've given obviously are very very wide um but i I mean just briefly to skip back to your previous response alex that picture i am i could immediately visualize it the one that you mentioned that you we were together when you shot it uh because i do think genuinely it's it's incredibly strong partly because of its restraint it doesn't it doesn't showboat light in the way that so much mountain photography does. It doesn't need to because of the way that it's seen and the complexity of the composition, the texture of the rock. And and so I think maybe that picture proves that it's possible to make mountain pictures that are that can still surprise you and uh, and give you something new in your experience of what it means to be outside and what beauty means as well. So, yeah, I think it, it's uh, it's always going to be an open question. Yeah, so picking apart Brian's question more specifically from what differentiates mountain photography from other subgenres of landscape photography, I think one problem that you really have is giving any sense of the scale uh, and depth that you have in the mountains and that experience uh, that you have when you're out there. And that's an intangible for me. I'm not sure what that quality really is or looks like in a photograph it's that sort of goal that is always out of reach sometimes you know when you've when you've achieved it but to me it doesn't seem like an ingredient that i could break down into any um uh, sort of set of of rules or ideas i mean we can talk about depth in terms of um atmospherics coming through that give a physical sense of depth and we can talk about uh color and warmer colors coming forward and cooler colors uh disappearing into the difference and we, uh, distance and we can talk about scale in terms of the mountains potentially having a, a reference for scale a, a tree or a person or uh in terms of how much of the physical height of the frame they take up, which is certainly one of the reasons I think panoramas can be effective because you can have quite a wide scene whilst the mountains physically take up a reasonable proportion of the height of the frame. I think that does help them to look slightly larger. But uh, unfortunately, um, and I I suppose this could be uh, the case with, with other forms of landscape photography, actually figuring out those ingredients that come together to produce a compelling image is pretty hard to to break down i don't don't know how you guys feel about that no i think i think it's hmm. i think as you as you start in photography there is this idea that there are ultimate images and also perhaps when you start in photography you're turned on by certain styles of sublime amazing light because it's things that you don't see very often um but as you, as you do get more mature 
in the way you approach photography, you start to realize that the, that the beauty can happen anywhere. One of the, one of the interesting things as part of that is when you go out with somebody like Joe or David Ward or yourself, Alex, and you're thinking, well, there's not many pictures to be taken here. And then when you get back and see what somebody's done and go, oh, wow. Okay. There was something after all, it's just my, my block, not uh, a general block. Cause a lot of people would say in your book, I wish I was there for some of those pictures that you've taken. And, and if they had been there, they probably didn't wish they were there after all. Uh, cause it's, it's like that <laughs> in the mountains. It's it, what you see in a picture. Isn't what it's like in the, in the moment. Uh, and it's, and it is more transformative than you would think. People say, oh, photography, it's just a representation, but it really isn't when you, when you can stand next to somebody and not see what they've done and what they've brought back with their camera, it's that, that makes a big difference for me. Yeah. And, and on that note, Tim, I think that, uh, I was really, uh, you know, thinking about Alex's book in particular, and also Alex's comment about it being unfortunate that you can't sort of formulate it well I, I kind of disagree because i think it's quite fortunate that you can <laughs> turn in a way that's part of the magic of the creative process it's both, Joe, it's both. it is uh, yeah no that's right but it, it would be lovely if you could be more consistent but on the other hand we can't you know that's the, the uncertainty principle is is part of what keeps you hungry to go out and see if you can do better next time uh, and and I do genuinely think that is part of the, the being a creative person. Um, you know, you, there's always another challenge. I, I mean, there are I, just thinking about what Tim was saying about the experience. I think your account of the of the winter days that you spent with Mez on Avajan uh, was one of the best parts of the book for me. And I love both the writing, but uh, but also the photographs that you took on on that. Uh, expedition i think we can we can call it that um were brilliant um and and so combined what was fascinating was seeing how the pictures had this sort of lucid beauty to them um that conveyed the cold and and all of that but what they couldn't of course convey was the amount of effort <laughs> that it took so as tim was saying we'd we probably all imagine we'd love to have been there but we might not have might not have enjoyed <laughs> all that effort of, of uh, you know, of cutting steps through deep snow and um, climbing several thousand feet in order to, to see that scene. But boy, I, I was so impressed by those pictures. And I, if I was a bit younger, I think I, I would love to have been there with you. I'm sure you could have done it, Joe. <laughs> You're one of the fittest people I've hiked with still, um, right, even right. though you seem to think otherwise. But... <laughs> Well, um, anyway, I mean, it's, of course, it would be great if fitness didn't come into it. But unfortunately, it is quite an important aspect of, of doing this this work, isn't it? And um, and it's one of the gifts that photography gives you is actually the continued reasonable. One, one of the well problems with fitness it. is it doesn't seem to matter how fit you get. It always hurts. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, that is true. Um, well, because you're always, well, always pushing yourself to your limits, aren't you? I guess yeah, that's exactly. the nature of it. Uh, last yeah. question from Brian was, was uh, the interesting one that we've seen in the Natural Landscape Photography Awards is that there's been a general move recently, or a trend, let's call it, uh, away from the grand landscape and towards more intimate work for various reasons. And I think it's in many ways it's a good thing because I think people can develop in their photography working in a more intimate fashion. It gives a lot more scope. Um, but does that you think that's changing the way mountain photography is seen? We see we see a lack of good mountainous photography in the competition or general uh, grand landscape photography. Do you, do you think it's gone out of fashion, or is it just that there's more people out there and it's hard? Uh, Alex, I, I I mean I, I think it has gone out of fashion to a degree. I mean one of the things that social media has undoubtedly done is is create these trends and these shifts in different ways. And I know I've chatted with this. Uh, about this um, with Joe before, and he's somewhat isolated from that because he's not spending quite so much time on, on social media, but certainly that seems to amplify any of these shifts. Um, and certainly some of the photographers who I felt were making some of the strongest uh, grand landscape images have moved increasingly into this more um, intimate style. And there's a whole host of reasons for that. And Broadly speaking, I think it's been a great thing for landscape photography because finally we've um, 
divorced ourselves from this very simplistic impression of what landscape photography should be, which is epic light, epic mountains, wide views, um, which was vastly overdone, incredibly boring um, by by the point um, 500 px and so on had um, filled our eyeballs with every technicolor rainbow and epic mountain scene imaginable i i was yeah i was pretty much done with it by that point um because you can only go so far and then of course the processing comes in and you realize you can go even further and and we got these more and more extreme things and you know um that that kind of thing has been hashed out plenty of times before but it has been a good thing um seeing more of this intimate work i think there's limits to what i I think is really strong work and I think in some ways we might be going a bit too far where you can just take a photo of a pattern or some trees and, and call it art which I don't always feel that it is um but but it has been a good thing and uh I, you know for, for me personally um I've stayed with my approach in part because I see everybody else shifting in other ways and, and I look at somebody like Joe and I think how did Joe become so good at, at what he does and i think a big part of that is time and persistence and and learning your own style and and your own preferences um maybe maybe joe can can speak a bit more about that hmm. thanks well I, I i think that there's several different elements to this one is i think there's inevitably uh ebbs and flows of style uh which are a sort of trend based um but i i am also trying to trying to see this in in the wider sort of historic context of of the history of photography because there've been there's been mountain photography done since the the middle of the 19th century and we shouldn't forget that and i think it, it's to me i still find i'm quite gripped when i look at a great carlton watkins photograph from the sierra nevada in 18 in the 1860s uh, which you have no sky because of panchromatic film so he's totally dependent on form to to create compositions that engage the the, the eye uh, and and he succeeds sometimes in doing that brilliantly in spite of the fact he's using a camera that's 16 by 20 inches or thereabouts which he built himself you know with all of the technical difficulties that are involved in that so you you can you can see that then time goes by mountain photography maybe a becomes less fashionable, especially when there are world wars raging and, and so on. Uh, and, and then it, it, we come into the, towards the end of the 20th century, very good color films evolving, and then suddenly digital arrives. And so what, you're see, what you've seen is an explosion of interest in landscape photography because the technology enables us to, to record it with a great deal more well both accuracy but also more creativity than than in the past and yet you look back and there was still the likes of o'sullivan timothy o'sullivan and carlton watkins francis frith and, and so on who who photographed in the 19th century who used form foregrounds and uh shape and co uh, not color but um but tone as a way of of making their images truly engaging um, so it is. It isn't something that's that's just arrived, uh, but but something has changed as technology has has in, in enabled us uh, to use uh, form more powerfully. I suppose uh, one thinks of. I mean, I used uh, with the five by four camera, like like large format cameras for before me, uh, using the tilt mechanism of the of the camera to. Uh, to synthesize focus from the foreground through the middle distance into the background. Now many people can achieve something very similar with st focus stacking if they want to do something extreme. Uh, and, and actually, I think that has tended to produce a, a, a rather overhyped, overblown method of composition from time to time, just because it can be done rather than should it be done, as it were. Um, and I think ultimately the best work is something that has got balance and doesn't feel forced. Uh, and maybe that's one one thing that we could talk about a bit more at some point. But it is a fascinating area. I think that the ultimately work that has uh, has beauty and integrity because even in its abstract form it works is 
a, a goal from my point of view. So literally, if you can turn the picture upside down and it's still satisfying to look at, then that's a good sign. And the one other thought, because I'm looking, Alex, at, at your room at the moment, and I can see a picture that's shot from a high elevation just behind mm-hmm. you. And that reminds me to say that, that another reason that there might be a trend away from pure mountain photography, let's say, w- without the, the kind of intimate element, is that drones may be starting to kind of, supp- not supplant, but they, they're providing an alternative for a, a wide view, which many people want to adopt. Uh, and of course, drones are amazing, the perspective that they can create. And I think that perhaps shifts the emphasis when you're a terrestrial photographer to looking more carefully at what's immediately around you. I was, yeah, that's, that's, that's an interesting and not something that I'd, I'd really considered, but that, that may well, well be a, a feature. I mean, I, I think broadly speaking, one of the, the best things about um, intimate photography in contrast to grand landscape photography is just the degree to which grand landscape photography is a, a literal form of, uh, of photography. Generally, what you see is what the scene was like, at least if you're processing in, in, a, in the way that ways that we do. Um, whereas, obviously, with intimate photography, that abstraction does give you the ability to suggest these ideas that are much, much harder in in grand la- landscape photography. And in fact, there's really only one image in my book that I feel suggests things that aren't immediately uh, obvious um, when you when you first look at the book and that's the nature of shooting these wide views and I think that's a great part of the appeal of photographers looking particularly to differentiate themselves as artists is that it's potentially somewhere where it's a little bit easier um, or at least there are more opportunities to express ideas that are not immediately obvious. I think you see this in the history of photography with um, Western and and, and Stieglitz and then the photographers reacting against Ansel Adams. You know, Ansel Adams got dismissed for his um, representative views of the landscape uh, and the wider views and the people who are doing uh, writing about the philosophy of photography and the in- interesting takes on the whys were doing more intimate work, photographing vegetables or um, bits of details of beaches, etc. And it's, and I think that's that could be because they're trying to interpret something in in depth with mountains is difficult because they only represent a certain range of ideas. I I also think there's there's another aspect of this, which is the social media and the desire to have a, a long, continuous output of images on a regular basis makes it more difficult to do that with mountain photography. I mean, you, to have a great mountain shot and another one and another one and another one on and put out like maybe two or three a week at least is going to be hard unless you're out in the mountains all of the time. Whereas if you're if you're on a week long trip, maybe one of those days is a good mountain weather day or whatever. The rest of the time you're wandering around taking pictures of the smaller scenes. So you're going to have naturally a, a, a greater supply of those images as a photographer. So it it could be as little as that. I mean, you see the people who do take mountain photographies. I mean, Alexander Deschamps maybe is an example. His his output isn't prolific, and he does out, put out more intimate images as well. Um, I can't think of many photographers who are continually putting out mountain images. I don't know. You, you probably know more than me, Alex. Yeah, I yeah I I can't think of those people either, unless they're people who have a lot of assistance. Let's say with helicopters and uh, <laughs> and yeah. vehicles that can can take them take them places a, a bit more easily but certainly if you're talking about people who are backpacking with, with cameras into wilderness areas um there, there are a few but they're the the real extreme cases of people who are happy to spend more than 100 nights in a tent a year which i'm certainly not <laughs> <laughs> okay we're gonna, i want to ask a couple of questions about the uh, the book design um and this is from francesca caravellano uh, who asked uh did you do the design of the books yourselves? And also, I mean, this is to both you and uh, Alex and Joe from different angles. Uh, or did you find a designer or is it somewhere in, in between? And, and uh, yeah, I'll be interested in any takes on that. Do you want to, do you want to start off, Joe? Well, Alex. Sure. Um, 
Sorry. Oops. <laughs> Shall I go first? Yeah, I'll go try on. and be really quick because I think it's probably much more interesting to hear what Alex has to say. But uh, yeah, back in the 2000s when uh, I did Scotland's Mountains, uh, uh, I, I was lucky to work with Eddie Ephraims and Eddie was most definitely the designer. Uh, and and most of the time, I just say yes, that looks great <laughs> when when he would do things. He's a very creative guy, and uh, he does he does love to experiment a lot. Um, but in the end, he'll come back with a very very well balanced and well uh, conceived design. And I know that that's true, Tim, because you yourself have been inspired by his books um, yeah, in the way that you, you design uh, your books. But um, yeah, so I. I can't claim to be a, a book designer by any stretch, but I'm lucky to work with some good ones. I know Alex. I know you've yeah. I mean, I guess that most of it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that question kind of gets at whether you should have a designer and what a designer can bring. And I think there's lots of ways of answering that question, and it will be dependent to a degree on what your preferences are and how your work might be presented. Um, I mean, both of the books I've produced, in terms of the, the photo layouts especially, it, the design couldn't really be simpler. I mean, I might be making some images smaller and some images bigger, but generally they have even margins around the page. And, and the entire aim of that is is to take the design out of the equation, really. Um, and, you know, I, I'm not sure that I want the design to be noticed. Um, and, and if it is noticed i want it to be seen as you know done well but not done cleverly if that makes sense um because that isn't what i i want my books to be i don't want them to be statements about my ability or anybody else as a, as a designer and, and i did take some advice um from a, a designer friend of mine called uh, john o'renton who is very busy who i wasn't paying so uh, he perhaps couldn't give me uh, the time that that i would have needed to to make for a, a perfectly designed book like uh, someone like darren uh, might make but I, I think that there are other books that I love that take the design more seriously as a part of the creative output. So, you know, a, a book is this this combination of the book as a thing and the presentation of the images. And in some ways, they they are two different things, but they're obviously combined in, in book form. Um, and Sandra Bartoka and you know her books and the books she's done for Theo Bosboom, they're, they're a great example of how design it can be integrated to um, not only uh, show the photographs, but but perhaps give a different impression of the photographs um, through the way that they're physically laid out on the page. And I think that can be done to great effect. Uh, so it really depends on your style of photography and your preferences as, as to whether you think that would add something or, or detract from your work. Because in my case, I feel like it would detract. And in Sandra's case, I think it, it adds immeasurably, particularly because she is the designer. And so it's making a statement about her as, as the creative person. Yeah, I think when you look at books, I mean, when I was looking at the natural landscape books, uh, I, I looked through a, a very large amount of books that I have to try and get some inspiration and find out what it is I liked about um, photography books. And there's a range you can probably represent from a, a catalogue book, which is basically a introductory preface and then just a series of plates filling the whole book maybe maybe with chapters maybe not without at one end of the scale and at the other end of the scale you have um books that are not necessarily photography books which have a lot of narrative around things um like perhaps a walking book that has some good photography in there and and there are very few books that do the middle ground i mean i i, I like the fact in your book that the Two of the really creative things were the maps that you used um, and, and the writing in the essays, which worked perfectly to try and put some rhythm into the books. And I think that's the key in terms of design is, is to try and take a block of images that could get very tiring. It's like a song that goes on the same uh, verse all the way through and break it up so that you are uh, it's like a refreshed palate in a meal or something. You're, you're having something in the middle to take your mind off it, to get, think about something else and then go back into the images. Um, and, the, and the, there aren't many books that do that well. I think Joe's, Joe's uh, First Light, which is fantastic with the essays and the secondary images on the page, give you something on every image to read about. 
Uh, and then Eddie Ephraim's other, other books, Creating Vision and Style, I think that's one of them is called, or Developing Vision and Style, that's the name of it, um, had a lot of images from multiple photographers with, with small comments by uh, photographers about the images themselves, and then occasional double page feature essays about a single image, perhaps. And it's that rhythm, I think, that makes the most interesting part of design. Um, and then let the, let the images do the work. So I, I base the natural landscape book very much on that, uh, but it's still got to make the images work. There's no point. I say there's no point. I have a couple of books that are very much more creative. So they combine type and graphics and art on top of photographs in some cases that looks fantastic, but I can't enjoy the images as photographs in the same way as I would in another book. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a funny striking balance, but anybody who's asking this, I would, I would say try and avoid just making a catalogue. Um, I think it can devalue your work if that's, that's what you end up doing. Um, a quick one, we'll just cover uh, calibration because I've got a, the other question from Francesco was about what did you do to your images to try and get them profiled for the book? And I know we both worked on this uh, for the natural landscape book as well, but uh, what can you tell us in brief about what the process should be like? I think the process probably at its best is you convert your images into uh, the correct profile, which for my book was Fogra 39, although I think we might be moving to Fogra 51 now, which is uh, a CMYK profile, um, CYMK profile, um, just like uh, any other RGB profile, really. I mean, the, the process of conversion is exactly the same. You have your rendering intent that you can choose, and, and the color shifts may be more dramatic with certain colors, particularly rich ultramarines. But in general, your image should look almost identical um, with some exceptions when you've made that conversion. And then it should also print um, the same as you see on screen, assume, assuming that the whole process is calibrated correctly. So that's maybe how it should work. In practice, there are all sorts of things that mean it may or may not work that way in reality. There are practical issues with printing um, that, that might mean there are some color inaccuracies. So one thing that uh, that listeners to this podcast might not know is that there is there are no two books made the same um, if they're printed uh, in a color offset way because the ink densities are always changing. So from page to page, every single image will be different from one book to another or even across a double page spread if they're printed on uh, separate sheets. And so a mark of a good printer really is being able to keep that as consistent as possible whilst uh, the ink levels change and also uh, matching, you know, obviously what you've actually effectively requested um, in terms of the colors of your images. Um, but even if you can get all of that right, there are other practical um, problems. Uh, one of which is the layers of ink and the order in which they go down that can introduce uh, some color shifts. You also have problems where if you have very low densities of an ink on uh, one Im of ink on one image and then immediately above it very high densities uh, on that same sheet, then the two images can affect one another, um, which when you have very low ink densities can create hue shifts and that might be a point at which you need to intervene in the print process. So um, whilst in theory an absolutely perfect output is possible in practice that is never possible and it's a mark of a good printer being able to manage some of those uh, practical difficulties. Printing, printing books is is nearly always a compromise and I think anybody who, anybody who thinks they can have absolute control and print things like they were on an inkjet printer is in for a, in for a disappointment. However, having said that, both all three of us have had experience of our, our own work and also other people's books he heard from where the printing hasn't gone as they like and they're very disappointed with it with the output. And nobody who reads the books as customers will ever notice. It's it's an extraordinary process. I think there might be a few people, if you go up there and you have a print on your wall of a po picture and you bring up your book and compare it directly with it, you'll notice some differences. But people don't do that. Uh, and even if people do do that, they they forgive a lot of this because the, because the books are about images they're not about accurate production so i mean what do what do you think about the process joe 
Uh, well, I, I just agree with everything you said, I'm afraid, in a boring kind of way, but just as, as an amusing anecdote, uh, and to confirm what you've said, Tim, uh, I, had a, I, I had a panicky message from Alex about uh, two months ago saying, oh, the book's printed and I'm not sure what I think of it. And um, so he sent me a copy. This is uh, uh, yeah, the, the Great Wilderness. And it arrived and I was sort of expecting the worst. And page after page of wonderful images all looking absolutely brilliant um and i i found myself thinking hmm i think I, I detect a little bit of kind of photographer anxiety syndrome here um and you know i've been through it myself you, you obviously have uh and and we we do over stress uh, so it's important to keep things in perspective uh as as alex said uh it is literally impossible with offset light though to perfectly reproduce every every image as you see it on your screen because of the juxtapositions of uh, on a layout inevitably you can't print single images it would be far too big um you know fill up a, a whole uh a or it'd be b3 or a1 or whatever it would be sorry um but very large bits of paper relatively speaking which have to be cut down for book use so um inevitably there are those compromises and it's about making the best possible compromises uh, that you can. A, a, a really skilled print um, print man, print technician, print might be a print woman, of course, um, will do a great job. And uh, and you just have to accept, uh, you know, that they're they're going to be ninety five percent. I think it's a good goal of uh, color accuracy, um, and accept that. Uh, you know, the perfectionist in us is never going to be fulfilled completely. However, when you look at the book and you think about its context, what it represents, and it is the, the best for the photographer, it's, it's really the ultimate legacy we can leave the world, I think. It's what it's, it's our, our statement. Um, and other people looking through it, and you know, they've got no, they haven't looked at the pictures on the screen, they're not comparing them, they don't care anyway. So you have to let go a little bit, I would say, of, yeah. um, of the perfectionist instance. I think as a, as a more um, general point, I think thinking about the the colours um, that are possible with offset litho and particularly uh, with blues is really interesting because I think it was Tim who told me first that you can't print ultramarine in a book. I mean, you can if you add an extra colour, um, which which some photographers have done, but that's the uh, exception, not the rule. And you really can't print a rich ultramarine blue. And so all my life I'd looked at images in books with ultramarine blues in, not realising that they are only a fraction of the colour intensity um, that that we could reproduce on screen, certainly, but even on a, on a desktop printer these days. And that to me is a really interesting point because I hadn't noticed and I think I'm good with colour. Um, and yet we worry so much about colour spaces and this slight increase in saturation we might be able to get in reds if we use Adobe RGB. And, and I think we, we sometimes lose the plot completely with, with these kinds of, of technical things, because whilst it's good to have the best, uh, it's important to know what the best actually means and, and the, the trade offs that, that you might have there. Um, yeah, so I just, I just thought I'd make that point because, it, I mean, generally seeing just how far short litho can be um, versus the experience you have of it, it is an interesting one in general when we when we think about how we represent color. As a, as a last point from there as well is when I when I first got my copies of a, the Natural Landscape, the first book, I opened them up and and thought they were absolutely terrible. Um, didn't even think about the fact I was looking them in the kitchen uh, and the LED lights I had were just really low quality LED lights for color. And it had taken my pictures and put about almost like like plus 10% magenta across the whole picture. And then you, you move into another room and you look in, a, in, in another LED light and they look great. And then you go outside and they look different again. And that, and that difference is not subtle. It's really big difference. And, and nobody does that. Nobody sits there and makes sure they're under a, a proper high CRI light source when they're reading the books. Um, and yet everybody's happy with what they get. Our eyes are very good and our brains are very good at normalizing what we see in terms of subject. And I think people will listen to what you're saying there, Tim, and think you're just talking about white balance, you know, having some orange light on versus some no, daylight on. Yeah. And it isn't that at all. It's yeah. the frequencies of light and how they excite 
the ink specifically and you can get these wild hue shifts you, re you really can and uh, i think if you print your own work then you suddenly realize just how substantial those changes can be um even uh, t to my uh, right here i've got a daylight bulb but of course it's not sort of calibrated light whereas to my left i have a sort of soft box that is calibrated and the difference between those two even they, though they appear to be exactly the same color is absolutely enormous uh, when it comes to uh, the colours that are shown in in a book, and and still even then, good quality daylight lights. I've got a just normal like booth in the corner there, but it uses fluorescence or LEDs, and it still has problems with colour. The only the only true colour that will represent mm -hmm. really, I mean, there's no such thing as true colour. That's another philosophical thing, is going out in daylight. And I do some uh, painting photography occasionally, and I the, the only way I've got found to do that properly is to go out on a cloudy day and set it up in the yard, because I've got some diffuse light. Anyway, before we go on about that, colour colour is one of these things you can go on for a very long time. Yeah, you can do a whole podcast episode on that, uh, Tim, <laughs> and, probably, and actually you should, because you probably should, yeah. not many people know as much as you about colour. <laughs> Andrew Mohan asks, um, and I'll start start with you, Joe, on this one, because it's, he's, he's aimed them at uh, Alex, but I think it's quite interesting anyway. What opinion do you hold about landscape photography that tends to differ significantly from the mainstream views or commonly accepted practices? In other words, why are you weird? Well, if you're asking me, I mean, I, I guess it's because I've always been weird, uh, probably. I, 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 I really think that actually, um, that's a very important thing in the creative world to, to, to just be yourself, isn't it? Uh, and one of the things that uh, we, I mean, maybe this is going off piece rather, but I think that we all want to be different. We all want to be ourselves. And, you know, that is, part of the kind of philosophy of being in, certainly in the west of being um, a creative person you want to be you want to be different you want to be individual as to as to andrew's question uh my view of photography i'm not i mean it is it's a question that's that's aimed at alex um more than me uh but in, in terms of of mountain photography i i really couldn't say what that difference would be i still personally think that um that the pursuit of beauty whatever whatever your idea of beauty is 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 probably the underlying goal it's just that it's it's elusive you, you don't actually know exactly what it is and it's the experience of being out in nature and and discovering the you know rediscovering the joy of being there each time you go is 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 what makes photography for me in itself worthwhile i think and uh, the the fact that it just having a camera with me gives me a sort of sense of of purpose and focus which which perhaps i don't have as much if i'm just out for a walk uh, i just think it's a most fantastic opportunity to reconnect with with the natural world and i think that there's i don't have a preconception of what i want to do generally when i go out with my camera does that you know influence the way no, that I've i think about other I think that work, probably works because people do have, I think in general, that the, the typical way people work is to have preconceptions of what they want and plan things in detail. So your, your lack of your lack of expectation going out works as a as a slightly different one. But but you, Alex, you were you were the target of this one. I know you you probably have a few things that you do very different to other people. I can think of a few. Well, maybe you should tell me and it'll make it easier to answer the question. But um, I, I mean, I think one thing that I have found about my own approach that, that is different, that, that's quite significant, is how I view the role of creativity and originality and artistry and whether that actually matters. Um, and, and of course, it, it does matter and it, it should matter, but not always. And I think one of the, the strange things for me about people's perception of photography is that creating um, a representational view of, of reality and almost taking yourself out of the process completely, uh, just showing the world as it is, is somehow seen as a lesser form of, quote, the, the art, um, which I suppose it is if you're defining it as, a, as an art. Um, but, uh, you know, for, for me, um, representation can be one of the highest forms of the art because it's it's one of the most powerful things that photography can do. And, and this does get discussed, but I don't think people actually... Um, encompass that idea into their approach in, in the way that that they might and say, oh, I don't care if I am just uh, showing the view um, and instead 
uh, they, they focus so much on the artistry that they can't enjoy that kind of little approach of, do you know what, I'm going to capture an image that makes the viewer think that they could have taken that, that photograph. Um, so for many people, were they to receive that, that comment, they would see that as an insult. I could have taken that photo if I was there um, because it implies that they don't have any um, artistic input into into how the scene is actually photographed but for me it's almost a compliment because it shows that i've created something that they can engage in uh and puts them uh, in the scene yeah I said, I said how do you I'm... feel about that joe oh sorry yes i i would uh, i would absolutely agree uh, in the sense that in a way the most engaging photographs of all for me are those where what you see feels completely that there's no intervention. I mean, one of my favorite photographers is Peter Dombrovskis, as you both know. And and Peter's work is artful in its artlessness, perhaps, in the sense that, I mean, they're beautiful photographs, of course, um, but you feel they're totally unforced. They're not, they're not kind of artfully done. They're just done with incredibly, actually what they are do, done with is incredibly precise and clear, a, a very clear concept um, of uh, of approach. And that, that approach is, it's not about me, it's about the subject. And in a way that distills the idea or a philosophy that I, I believe in and I aspire to personally. Um, and it's very parallel with what you, Alex, what you just described. Uh, whether it's the same philosophical impulse, I'm not sure, but um, I, I do think the idea of the that the subject matter itself is the is the most important thing, and the photographer's role, from my point of view, is to get out of the way and to allow the subject to speak. And it's really the the, the idea is if you do your job really well, a bit like being a really good designer, you don't notice the photography, you just see the beauty or the place or the moment or whatever it is that's the kind of you know the content of, of the photograph which might be quite complex but it, it's it's done in a way that reveals rather than rather than what's the word um puts lots of source on i mean if you take co the cooking example um because i think that works quite well sometimes in photography there's a lot of a, a lot of photography that we see that is overcooked uh, or over um, sourced or over sweet, even. Yeah. I think that that goes to one of Herbert Schlatt's questions, actually, which is about what you regard as art in photography. And I think I, I'm, it's a bit of a bugbear of mine, and I completely agree with both of you. That, and the bugbear is that when somebody says that the mere act of choosing um, where, where to point your camera and how to crop it is an art. The art has to come in the post-processing somehow, and I completely disagree. I think that's the perfect, the perfect essence of the art of photography is that choice of where am I pointing the camera at and what am I cropping it to. That that those two choices you know, are the are the art in photography. And if it if that isn't art, then it's not. I don't understand what photography is really. I think that the idea that we need to do lots of post-processing and then it becomes more art because we've played around with it is 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 wrong. Um, yeah, I'll go as far as and, and going back, going back to some of my favorite images of, of Joe's, actually, one of one of the interesting things is that uh, one of the things that I've always had is separated Joe's work from other people's is his approach to photographing complex subjects. And there are a few images in, in Scotland's mountains, for example, where he has photographed what appears to be an ugly scree slope. Um, and yet somehow there's a, there's an ease to it. And and that's partly the lighting. I mean, I think if you had the kind of fantastical contrasty lighting we were talking about earlier, those images really wouldn't work at all. Um, but th there's an ease to the composition uh, that doesn't show itself at all. So it looks like you have a uh, just a photograph of a scree slope, and yet it feels very comfortable on the eye. So you know he's maybe done something clever but actually nobody's ever going to notice that unless they've tried photographing that kind of subject matter themselves and know how challenging it is. So it's a really hard thing to express because you you almost want the photograph to look like a snapshot and yet have all of the beauty that might come with the approach of a, a really accomplished composition. Yeah, I think a lot of a lot of yeah, good photographers have said very much the same, that it's a, 
Uh, I mean, Ruskin, Ruskin, I think, was one of the original persons to say it. It's, it's like a, a scene glimpsed askance um, as in passing, and that's that's the ultimate of what the uh, romantics used to think. Is that about right, Joe, from my interpretation of it? I, I, Tim, I think your uh, you, your grasp of the academics of art history are way better than mine. I, but I think that is right, and 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 the philosophy is very clear. And I think it is about revealing the reality of the world, but in a way that you you can. I was like, yeah, it's really hard to say, but it, it becomes universal. It, it's a bit like, you know, Michelangelo said that he, he all he was doing was removing the excess from the marble so you could see what was contained inside. And that's a, a kind of, it describes an incredibly complex process that um, where, you know, as a, in his case, being a sort of master craftsman, um, having bashed away at marble probably from the age of eight in a, or so in a, in a master's sculptor's studio, um, he would have a, an intimate understanding of the stone um, which, of course, most of us w- would never know. Uh, and, and in a way, one of the problems with photography, I would say, in, in the contemporary world is that everybody has a camera and that's in their phone. And that's good because there, there's a lot of experience of using using it, but they don't, necess- don't necessarily study uh, the philosophy or the uh, artistic process um, in a way that's coherent with producing pictures that will really last so they might have a very quick impact uh that's that's fine of course because we're in that quick impact social media world but to make pictures that have a little bit more depth um i would suggest that it's probably more likely that you'll get there by using a large format camera and looking at the, at the world upside down for a few years i actually think that's probably how to develop that kind of uh, of depth uh, and, and just briefly tim what you said about um about the, the uh knowing where to stand and how to frame which in you know is a sort of uh the fundamental i see it's the absolute foundation of, of all good landscape photography and the the how whether you know whether you make black and white pictures in the dark room or, or you're a digital color photographer and everything in between the post-production is there to serve the concept created in the field so it, it it's not it's important but it, it's it's very important that the two are in harmony but it's not because you're laying on lots of source in the post-production to use the cooking analogy again that makes it art the art comes from the original concept the vision the uh the positioning of the camera and the way that you you manage the fundamentals of the photographic process to reveal the subject and I think we're out of time here now. We've got up to about an hour. Um, one thing I'll finish for there is something that we discovered in in working with the Natural Landscape Awards uh, is when we looked at the first rounds of the competition uh, and looked at the scores, some of the pictures that came the highest were those that had some of the immediate impact that were quite strong in, in terms of presence. I, think, I can think of one category where the mountain picture was... Uh, leading the pack in terms of the best photograph. But the thing we discovered was as as time went on, when we gave all the pictures back to the judges and the judges spent some time with them, and then we had a long uh, five or six hour session looking at the pictures to try and work out which one what we wanted to win, things started shifting around and, and those more complex, less instant pictures became more interesting and, and came to the fore. So I think a lot of people who may judge what's good photography based on what wins competitions and what's um, seen on social media with getting the most likes is only a single small take of, of the way photography works and the way art works. And, and we very rarely see pictures that spend that can spend more time with us. And books, books are the way to do that. I would recommend anybody buy more books. Uh, I think Alex's, Alex's books and Joe's books are things to go back to and you can develop your own opinions of, um, of how photography works and what good photography is. So any, any last words, Alex, as our guest? Uh, no, not really. I just, uh, yeah, I'm 
I'm very happy to have uh, been discussing these things with you guys. Um, I'm looking, I'm going to put the pressure on you now uh, in two ways. One is to keep the podcast series going because I think it will be really good um, because I listened to the lockdown podcast that you did with uh, David David Ward as well a, a, a few times actually because uh, this kind of content isn't uh, readily available um, in most podcast discussions, there are there are some, um, and the other is since we've been talking about uh, books to publicly put more pressure on Joe to uh, self publish another book. Um, <laughs> I think so, because if we all keep family. pressuring him enough, uh, <laughs> then it will eventually happen. Thanks, Alex. Well, that's really kind. Um, and Tim, thank you so much as well for hosting uh, this today. I. I you know what? I think we've got a lot more questions that need to be asked that have come in, and I'm just a bit concerned that we that we don't uh, get round to them. So maybe we can just do another one as soon as possible and get on with the rest of the questions because we get some great questions that have come in yeah. uh, from the community. So, uh, you know what you think of that? Yeah. Well, well, we'll do another one again. I'd love to have you back uh, for future ones. And I, I, I cr cross fingers we will carry on doing these because I enjoy doing them as well. So, thank you very much.